All right, welcome back. Just uh, kicking off hour two here in the leadoff spot. Uh, my good friend who joins us every Friday to tell us what's really going on, policy analyst, former speechwriter for George H.W. Bush, one of the co-founders of the Tea Party movement, Michael Johns is with us. Mike, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it, as always. Uh, lots of crazy crap going on there. The pandemic, the riots, and, you know, the, the left-wing media wants to keep the news cycle all about fear, fright, and hysteria. And they don't want people hearing about the good accomplishments of our president. You compiled a little list of things to remind people how great our president has been doing. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the great political dangers right now is that these two major crises that we're confronting, one, obviously, the pandemic, which is rooted in China and which was allowed to escape China, almost certainly with the blessing of the Communist Party of China, and also the street riots, both taken on a you know, kind of anti-Trump dynamic, and he didn't create either of these crises. And I think one of the opportunities and yet cha political challenges really as we confront the remaining 100 days, less than 100 days now until this election is to kind of remind ourselves and our vote and voters of what an extraordinary uh, three years plus of accomplishments the president had up until these two issues uh, started. And of course, you kind of start with the major tax reform package, the biggest tax reform really in 30 years that this country's had, uh, which benefited the vast majority of middle income uh, workers in this country, 82% uh, of whom experienced uh, tax relief. And of course, importantly, the cut in the corporate rate, because we were under Obama, operating at a 35% corporate tax rate, the highest in the industrialized world. And this president, to his great credit, brought it down to 21%, which makes it competitive with other industrialized countries. That combined with major uh, deregulatory efforts, a general framework of trying to eliminate two major regulations for any new one that was put in place, um, were kind of the foundation of the beginning of a, a spark of a new economic renaissance in this country to the point where, you know, metric wise, we have more Americans working than at any time in the history of the country. Unemployment rates that were the lowest in 50 years and in key demographic areas, uh, African Americans, Hispanics and Asians, all time low uh, unemployment rates. And you know, on top of that, really the first president in modern times to take on uh, major trade challenges with uh, China and with our allies in EU and Japan as well, where we've had you know essentially very unfair tariff practices, currency manipulations, uh, subsidies, dumping practices, all of which you know we just had allowed to linger it and behind trade deficits, and obviously the massive uh, erosion of the manufacturing base of this country, which the president really had begun to restore with um, the creation of um, a significant number of, of jobs in that era. These were the jobs, of course, that Barack Obama famously said would need a magic wand to be returned to the United States. And yet this president with some pretty sound um, uh, policies was able to accomplish it in, in three years. He's clearly the most pro-life president uh, in our lifetimes. There was a lot of doubt raised by some of his Republican competitors in 2016 that he would violate those pledges and promises. And yet he's the first president to appear live in the um, pro-life march. Uh, you know, even Reagan used to always find some basis to do it by video. He got, you know, his on the Mexico City policy out of using foreign aid to subsidize abortions abroad, really has been the first president to take a fresh look at how our foreign aid is utilized at all, strengthened our Pentagon and our and our military capabilities with you know a trillion dollars of much needed investments, launched the the, uh, the space force, which is really the next frontier of challenges now from a national security standpoint to the United States. And I think it you know, got us out of a lot of these international quagmires of right. that yeah. we've been in. You yeah, start with WHO, the NAFTA, you know, all, all, all the, the Paris Climate Agreement, all this stuff. Yeah. This is just a, he just inherited a pile of crap. Um, 
A lot of people, you know, they only hear what the left wing says because they control most of the media. But um, Donald Trump was actually left with the cupboard bare on uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, Joe Biden and Barack Obama never restocked after SARS and stuff. They left them like an empty warehouse there. Um, and you had these guys like Cuomo out there saying he's going to need 40,000 respirators. He's going to need more hospital beds. And Donald Trump does things with the precision and speed of a businessman. He's a problem solver. He just gets things done. Um, and I personally thought, Mike, out of all the things you outlined, um, deregulation is huge. Um, but the tax cut where he gave these l large corporations that took all their money offshore, he gave them a favorable rate of 21% here where all that money started getting repatriated back. back to our country. And with yeah. less regulation and repatriation and the lower tax rate, to me, that was the witch's brew of greatness that really boosted the economy because a lot of money came back to America that was hiding offshore when Joe Biden and Barack Obama were running things. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's con it should be common sense, but it's not always, at least right. in politics, that, that uh, capital and money is going to flow to uh, countries that are hospitable to the treatment of it. And when you're, you know, charging tax rates, um, you know, federal, state and otherwise that become punitive, it shouldn't be any surprise that literally trillions of dollars moved outside of this country under Obama and his predecessors. And this president, to his great credit, created a set of policies that incentivized them to return back to the United States. You know, there's, been, there's a policy that almost no one outside of Washington, D.C. has ever heard of called managed decline. And the theory of it is one that has guided American foreign policy and domestic policy for a long time. The theory is basically rooted in the fact that the United States days as a leader in manufacturing and even as a global economic leader are were coming to an end. And that it was in the U.S. best interest to kind of offload these responsibilities in a you know, sensible, calculated, smooth way. It kind of acknowledged the inevitability of China's ascent. And this president, of course, has completely, to his credit, rejected that thesis and begun uh, not just to defend and support policies that are, you know, that are growing our economy and we're growing our economy, uh, but also has challenged the, the threat that's sort of been there, the the, the elephant in the room for decades uh, in communist China, which has been engaged in a multi-decade plan of displanting the U.S. in almost every leadership respect. So it's almost and, like when you when you talk about managed decline, um, just to put it in layman's terms for, for my audience and even myself, um, it's almost like, you know, if it, when you have somebody that's real sick, at the end and you just want to manage their final end of days you put them in a home you get them help you know you watch them right you manage their end right. of days um it's almost like barack obama and and his cronies uh, along with joe biden they wanted to go into managed decline mode um when there were all these remedies around you know it's like putting somebody in hospice uh, instead of giving them a pill that could save their life for another 50 years. Um, and that's the path that these people were putting us on, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a very establishment way of thinking that I think just about every American, if they were brought to understand it, would reject. And yet for decades in the rooms where our trade agreements and our regulations and our tax policies uh, and our foreign policy was, was developed, you know, really it was inherently based on sort of this assumption that China's ascent was both inevitable and also constructive, which, of course, you know, has been the biggest lie, I think, perpetuated in the area of foreign and trade policy, because the theory was always that as the Chinese economy developed, as it was integrated into uh, the world and, be and became more of an economic powerhouse, it would actually become more liberalized, more friendly to the West, uh, less abusive of human rights. And just the opposite occurred. I mean, as uh, this regime has used, you know, intellectual property theft and all sorts of illegal and deceptive techniques to grow its economy, it's become the leading threat, really, at this point, to the free world. 
and uh, its economic ascent is no longer and can no longer be viewed as anything constructive to the United States of America or to our allies. No doubt. And, um, you know, uh, there's just so many things this president has done. But to me, of all other things, he has categorically rejected the notion that we need to pander to China. And many people were conditioning us here in America, oh, that we got to buy more goods because they're our biggest trading partner. We really need them. They're not even our biggest trading partner. Canada and Mexico are our top two trading partners. And I think Donald Trump, his legacy will be written on how he got us out of this relationship with China where we were bowing down to them and just accepting their ascent and our decline. And um, I think he's got four more years in the bag. And... um, we got to leave it there, Mike. Thank you so much. You're the Thank best. You,